Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is game 12 from the 2023 World Chess Championship match. Ding Lorin has the white pieces in this one and trails five points to six in this race to seven and a half. Let's have a look. Another d4 game. Starts off quiet enough with e3. We had a quiet start to one of the games in this match with the London system. From here, c5. Knight b to d2. Tensions resolved. And by transposition, we have an exchange Carol Khan. Queen c7, c3, and a mysterious sixth move, bishop d7. Both players were asked about this move in the press conference. Nepomnishi added this was part of his preparation, and Ding Liren said he was happy to see the move because black would be a tempo down. What is maybe one of the points behind bishop to d7? There's clearly some concern along this diagonal. Black probably doesn't want to see a line with knight c6, bishop to b5. Um, after a6 takes, queen takes, maybe knight e5 is one he wants to shy away from, or maybe something like this, doesn't want to take on this structure. Either way, it's something related to this diagonal and some quick pressure with possibly bishop b5 if he plays knight c6 on this move 6. So in this game, it's bishop d7, bishop d3, knight c6 only now. Castles, and here goes the tempo loss. The bishop takes its second step. Make sure it gets outside of the pawn chain. So we got the bad bishop outside the pawn chain. Is this really a big deal that black has lost a tempo? Not really. Computer doesn't think it's anything... Uh, significant. Black has a very healthy structure. Both sides have a healthy structure and both sides have healthy pieces. Okay. From here, knight to f1, bishop d6, bishop g5, and black has a decision. Hang a right or a left. He goes kingside. And white goes now into a deep think. Spends about 30 minutes on this next move. Chooses bishop takes knight. What other move was he considering? He shared this in the press conference. This was interesting to um, hear. It was interesting to hear from him about this position. This was his other consideration, knight g3. And he said that after knight h5 and this sequence, he wasn't quite sure of the assessment of this position right here where black is up a pawn and white has the bishop pair and the more active pieces. Computer gives this around a minus 0.3. It says start poking around at the king side, provoke g6, and then fall back to f3. Okay, not easy to assess this position. Okay, at the end of the day, he chooses to give up the dark square bishop for the knight, damage the kingside structure, and next look to hunt the light square bishop. Now that these two are under white's control, h3 is nearby, and the light square bishop will have to be exchanged for the knight. We get just that. There is a half open file. Should we get to it right away with king h8, rook g8? Not yet. Computer is a fan of king h8 straight away, but it's probably not a wise choice for Nyapomnishi. Why do I say this? Well, he is ahead in the match, and if he goes with king to h8, that would mean he's welcome to some imbalance, and I think this is what maybe Dinglerin would maybe go for. If you play king h8, we could have this kind of sequence where white tracks down three pawns for the knight. Saying you could also play this first, maybe go after f6 instead of the d5 pawn, but either way, things are a bit more imbalanced. This is maybe what white is looking forward uh, to, an imbalanced, uh, material imbalance such as this. 
Black doesn't give him that chance. He plays first knight e7. Defending f5, defending against that sacrifice. From here, knight h5, this is a hole. This has been a hole ever since g takes f6. From here, king h8. g4 is now available after that knight h5 move. That hits. g pawns pinned, unpinned, white's ready to do similar. And right around here, one of the things that draws, that, that grabs my attention are these bishops. And I think to myself, which of the two, it's opposite color bishops, which of the two is functioning better? It seems like it's white's bishop currently. Got a lot of pressure on f5. This is ready to collapse for black now. This pawn is pinned from capturing on g4, by the way. That'll run into a mate in two. Black has to be clever here, has to be precise, and he is. He goes for this knight maneuver, knight g6. What's the idea? Well, he's ready to meet the move g takes f5. Okay, first of all, the move played in the game is bishop c2. If g takes f5, he's prepared to now play knight h4 and say, I could put my knight on the h-file as well. Got these corresponding squares, h4, h5, both are holes. The queen would have to go to e3. Black would recapture with the pawn, keeping this guy around. Possible intersection square, pivot for rook on g2. This is a very ugly structure for black, but black is considered winning here. This position is more so about peace play. And black is ready to double up on the G file. If there's a one day, if there's some capture on G6, black can straighten out the pawns, challenge the knight. Black is for choice here. Okay. There is no capture on F5 in this game, bishop to C2. This is where there's a shift now in the valuation. This does open up queen d3 move in some lines the computer's suggestion is to play rook to g1 and if bishop to h2 it says go here or this was even what was asked of ding Lirin in the press conference what was what were you going to maybe play if you went with rook to g1 bishop h2 rook there maybe looking to get this rook on the e-file all right at the end of the day, he chooses bishop to c2. Now comes knight h4. Queen e3, maybe with an eye on queen h6, or even an f-pawn advance. Queen h6 is cut out with rook g6. If you try and capture away on g4 right now, this would not be a good idea because white could enter. With queen h6, still considered around an even position, but with some very precise play now by black. White is now all of a sudden assuming these strong positions for the pieces, knight f6. It's defendable, but it's not really the, the, the correct way to be following up here, having to find these defensive moves. It's saying, even in this position right here, you have to you have to be really accurate as black and find a move like bishop f4 in this position and even this wild looking move g3 saying this bishop is going nowhere you're actually pinned so this is a this is a funny line if you were to move the bishop this is a pretty slick mate g2 check i said earlier the light square bishop was functioning better than this guy not here that would be a cool mate. Okay, my point here, this is a possible idea. Taking here is not a good choice for black because of queen h6. Aggressive posts are assumed by the white pieces, so it's first rook g6, rook g1, f4, queen d3, queen e7. So this rook was pinned along this diagonal, so nearby there may have been a move like knight 
to f6. This move is cutting out any knight f6 and also watching out for a possible g5 with then knight f6. This is a very strong reposition by the black queen. This is around a minus one and a half advantage now for black. This queen is taking up an excellent post now on the king's side. Great grip over the king side squares for black. How do you get rid of these strong pieces? Now, the computer says the best move for white is bishop to d1. He goes with c4. What is bishop d1 doing exactly? I don't know. Maybe looking to stop a possible advance, maybe anticipating an f4 advance. There could be some really quick pressure against g4. Now, when this rook move was played, I only mentioned that it was cutting out queen h6. It's also adding lateral defensive e6. So this is a possibility to increase this pressure against g4. From here, his try is c4. He's looking to mix things up, get some activity on the queen side. d takes c4 follows, and his idea is to get on this diagonal trying to interact with this knight on h5. The c-pawn is poison. If you take the c-pawn, you're losing control of f3, and this lands. That hurts. So, it's queen c3, and a very strong move now by black. It's around a minus 2 advantage for black b5, hanging on to the pawn, and white follows up with a4. So the big question here is, can't I go ahead and simply win the rook? What's wrong with that? Let's have a look. So as soon as the queen went here, we have this idea, maybe that idea. Seems like black is saying, you go ahead, take my rook. What's the issue? Let's see. In the game, it was a4. If you take the rook, black could recapture and say, where is your knight going? We're not finished yet, though, because white could go here and say, well, after you take my knight, I'm going to take on g3, and where is your knight going? Well, black would have a good move in this position, and it's queen d5 check, and the knight will be rescued. Well, more than that. It's going to la uh, land a massive fork on f3 and next take a rook with discovered check. So let's test one other variation. And that is this one right here where we flick in a different move. We don't go to g3 just yet. Suppose we say d5 check. And only after e5, then we go here. Now, how would this be different? Well, You'll notice now with these moves inserted, queen d5 is no longer a move. But there is a good move still for black. Only one move wins here for black, would win for black, and that is b4. Trying to distract the queen from guarding f3. The only way she can move and still defend f3 is by going to e3. Now black would be able to take. After the recapture, we have this skewer, and this position would get simplified at the end of the day, all the way down to a rook and pawn ending where black is simply up a pawn and have two very far advanced pawns. A passer already here and another one nearby. This is completely winning for black also controls the only open file. That's another thing that tips in black's favor. So black has a very good follow-up in the event of bishop takes rook on this move 26. White chooses a4, b4, queen takes c4. Now this can hit. Black doesn't go for it though. This is considered now a minus 3 evaluation 
he ends up spending not a whole lot of time at all. He picks rook a to g8, doubling up the rooks, maybe hinting next at f5. That may be nearby. He could have dropped into f3 straight away. So this was a very uh, powerful move. You could allow this fork. So let's carry this one now. If knight f3 was played, queen c6, the only try really, hitting the rook, hitting the knight, black would be able to take the rook on e1, the more active rook, and be on the bishop, and have a reply to the capture on a8, the counterpunch, rook g8. It goes a little bit further with queen e1, Actually, a lot further. This is this is a beautiful continuation. This is several moves deep, but many of these moves are all forced. Knight takes bishop. You got to recapture. Queen h4. You have to defend h3. How do you defend h3? Queen d3. And now there's f5. Pressure increased on g4, which is pinned. You cannot take. This knight would fall. Queen f3 to defend, capture, recapture, capture, recapture, capture, recapture. That's a lot of moves, but again, a lot of that is all forced or very forcing moves. White is losing this position. Black has one winning move. Can you spot it? Feel free to pause the video. Okay, here it is. B3. <laughs> After all of those kingside moves, we have this one queenside move, and that wins. Why? Oh, well, it's the endgame. We're supposed to bring the king towards the center. Well, you're too slow, because this was the idea behind b3. Right here, a move in left field. <laughs> this guy's pushing through. Guess who's not here to stop b1 equals queen? This guy's a long way off from stopping promotion. Okay, that is a really slick sequence, but hardly any time was spent at this moment right here. Okay, I believe it was just like maybe, oh, if I do that, I'm in a, I'm in a fork. Let's just double up the rooks. Doubling up the rooks is what we had. So a missed opportunity there. This was an option for white, capturing the bishop. It's around even. There's another opportunity for it where it's even better. After queen c6, the bishop is hit. This was a started to be right around this point, these last handful of moves, the next few moves, a lot of back and forth with the evaluation. Bishop is hit. It goes back to b8. Now all of a sudden white is for choice. A plus two evaluation if he spots bishop takes rook. Now, black has a better move than bishop to b8. The best move here is to play knight f6. This defends the bishop, attacks d4, and this guy is poison. The best continuation for white is to defend d4. If, if black had found knight to f5, it's to play rook to d1. And also, I should note with knight to f5, we're opening up h4 for the queen. Uh, also, if you try and capture the knight in this position, uh, that's no good because this guy falls. And there's no fear of losing the rook. Pawn takes rook because that's mate. And if rook takes rook, we could give this check. Then recapture, and now we're ready to take, discover, check, mate nearby. And if white wants to stop that idea, you have to capture here or push the pawn so that this guy can't make a capture. But after f3, white now has to give up the queen in order to stop mate on g2. Would have to take the pawn on f3. Okay, wanted to note a couple lines kicking off after this star move knight f5 that would really have turned the tables but bishop fell back to b8 straight away and now white 
is a golden opportunity to capture the rook on g6 on this move 29. In the game, he picks queen b7. He's going after f7, maybe the b pawn as well. Of the two, you'd probably prefer to take the f7 pawn because then e6 would be very weak. But what exactly was this missed opportunity? How would this have played out if he finally captured this rook? Pawn takes. Now there's this only move for white, d5 breaks through in the center e6 is now collapsing pawn takes knight pawn takes e6 and if you're recapturing on e6 now we get to capture here a lot of this is all forced you're taking a rook with check you're taking a pawn with check you're defending the only weak point in your position black is uh, having to react to all of these threats there's rook g1 maybe a check and you drop the bishop this would have been a winning continuation for white a great chance to get back in this match he did not find this though with bishop takes rook he went with queen b7 black plays rook h6 bishop e4 comes this pawn on f7 and b7 are poison if you take on f7 this knight gets to land on f3 the queen from b7 has this responsibility, defend f3. White defends that, and now this queen is ready to knock out one of these two. Black defends f7. Queen takes b, the rook is hit. Black goes back home with the queen to defend. Queen c3, hinting at d5, discovered check. From here, knight g6. Preparing to meet, d5 with bishop e5. White backs the bishop off, defends h3, and now this rook is eyeing up e5. So this is, once again, nearby, d5 discovered check. It's around an even position here. Queen h4, rook e2 defending f2, and now move 34. Not a whole lot of time spent on this one, about three minutes. F5, a grave error. He missed something in his calculations. If white responds to F5 with D5 check, black has only one good reply, and that is to play E5. But white doesn't have to play D5 in this position. This pawn is now hanging and white takes it after only about a minute and Nyapomnishi is rocked back in his seat basically and he's there for about 16 minutes before making his next move there isn't a good continuation now for black out of momentum i guess captures now the knight d5 is going to hit after g takes h5, queen takes h5, discovered check. King has to go to the g file. d6. That's the final move of this game 12. Black resigns. The bishop is cut off from seeing any of the kingside squares after d6. d5 is vacant for the bishop to hit. On this beautiful diagonal, ties in great with the queen. And then the rook is going to be pinning the knight. None of these pieces I have highlighted are functioning well for black. There's only one aggressive piece, but that h3 square, the queen has it covered. He's back in this match. It is now tied 6-6 six, six going into game 13. That's six draws and six decisive games in this match it's really incredible this was one of the most up and down games i've covered live it has really was really something else okay let's have a look at the tail of tape and we can see that this is reflected in the accuracy with this game with all the ups and downs uh he had right around what from move 19 through 26 Many ways this could have gone differently. 
back up with bishop to b8, back down. It was a roller coaster game. Queen b7, rook to h6. Yeah. And then finally, this mistake here, or mistake, a massive blunder with f5. A lot of inaccuracies, mistakes, and blunders. At the end of the day, 85% accuracy for Dingler in and 73% for Jan Nepomnishi. So it really did feel like the nerves got the best of Nepomnishi in this one. Uh, Ding Lorin pointed out that he really didn't feel nervous during the game, but yeah, it's back to level, and we are definitely going to see at least two more games. Two classical games must be played in order to determine a new world chess champion. So We'll see who that is soon enough. Feel free, as usual, to leave any feedback to this video in the comments section below. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe took a thing or two away. That's all for now. Take care.